All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, and welcome to this session of the seventh uh, uh, event of Kaust NVIDIA Workshop. And uh, as, as we've presented early this uh, week, uh, that's a, a long history of successful event and we are uh, exploring additional um, opportunities for learning uh, for our uh, users, uh, whether at Kaust or in the kingdom worldwide. And uh, today uh, we went through several events from an AI competition and hackathon that is going on and keynote talks. And today we are hitting uh, the, the, the part that is uh, preparing users for the uh, ML challenge happening tomorrow afternoon. Uh, so for those who are interested to take on that challenge, uh, this tutorial will be worthwhile for you guys. Um, so today's tutorial is an introduction to deep learning image classification using Keras. Uh, and uh, it, it will span across a couple of days, today and tomorrow, uh, with, with, with some examples. And you will learn how to use Kaggle, uh, which is the main platform for the, uh, 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 the ML challenge itself. Uh, so our speaker today is uh, Glendon Holst. Uh, he's a staff scientist at the Visualization Core Lab uh, at KAUST. Uh, he's been at Kaust for several years, and I know him for very many years. Uh, uh, he's uh, one of our best scientists uh, at, at the Core Labs, uh, and tackling not only visualization but also uh, specializing and having extensive expertise in HPC workflow solutions for deep learning, image processing, and scientific visualization. Uh, and without further ado, I give the floor to Glendon, and we can get started on our tutorial. Thank you so much. Fabulous. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Sabra. That's very, very kind. Um, so um, um, uh, I'm, I'm Glendon. And um, so uh, a thanks to Mosin and Sabra for, for basically providing the platform and organizing this. And today we also have my colleague, David Poog, who is um, a data scientist uh, in the uh, Visualization Core Lab and provides a lot of the other data science training and, 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 and deep learning support as well at KAUST. And so um, uh, he's gonna be there to kind of monitor the, 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 the questions, the channel, and, and to help out if people need um, um, to get un unstuck. So uh, without further ado, I will go in and share my screen and share a link. Um, so, um, give me one second. Okay, so in the um, in the chat, I'm going to post a, a link, which is is to Colab. Um, this is going to um, when you click on it, it will launch Google, uh, a, a launch the notebook that we will be working with today in Google Colab, which is a uh, service provided by Google that uh, allows you to run. Um, exploratory uh, you know, deep learning frameworks uh, inside a Jupyter notebook environment in the cloud. Um, it provides access to GPUs, which is kind of important for this training as well. And um, so what will happen is today, we're gonna go through some exercises to, to explore aspects of image classification using uh, the Keras framework. Uh, actually, we're gonna be using the one that's built into uh, TensorFlow 2. And, um, and we're going to explore a bunch of different aspects of, of transfer learning, um, starting with uh, pre-trained networks that were trained on ImageNet. And then tomorrow, what we will do is uh, we will uh, get a chance to take what we've learned today and try it uh, for ourselves with a different data set, a smaller data set. Um, we will try um, create our own uh, a, a, a deep neural network uh, and uh, uh, then train it. And, um, and then we'll use that as the basis to um, uh, evaluate our performance using the uh, Kaggle platform, uh, which is a, a platform that uh, hosts a variety of data sets, but also it's a community, kind of a, a, a community of data scientists um, and, and data science problems. Um, uh, they also provide uh, challenges for people to kind of compare um, 
the uh, re the results of you know their models that different people have created and kind of compare them to each other. So tomorrow, what will happen is that you'll get a chance to kind of um, try out what you've learned today and then use that to join a Kaggle competition um, uh, for, for digit recognition and compare your results against the rest of the community. And the, um, the um, you know, signing on to Kaggle and learning how to submit um, uh, your models and, and, um, and your solutions is going to help when you then go and do the uh, AI, uh, during the AI competition in the afternoon. So <clears throat> I'm going to go sh uh, share my screen here. Okay. <clears throat> so um, hopefully everyone sees that I am now in um, uh, my, my browser at uh, uh, a collab and I'm in a notebook that says deep learning from pre-trained models with Keras. So hopefully, if I'm not, <laughs> David, you can let me know. <clears throat> so, um, so, so what we're in right now is a, a, a notebook. So, so actually, so before we do that, um, let's go and just make sure that everyone is here in, in, the, um, in this notebook. So um, if you could, um, in the chat, uh, I, I, maybe you don't have the chat. If you could go, go, maybe go to your Q and A, and um, or just um, uh, you know, let us know if if you've if you're already there or if you're not, because um, it's kind of important. You'll want you'll want to be on this web page so that you can follow along. Okay, fabulous. Okay, we're starting to get the uh, attendees are are there. So if for the attendees, if you're not at this Google Colab page, um, please let us know. That's, um, and, and David will be able to help you. <clears throat> the, um, it would be good if you're logged in, I think. So myself, I was already logged into, um, in, into Google before I did this. Um, so um, cool. I, I'm going to assume now that everyone is, is, is there. Um, and we shall begin. Okay, so um, a Jupyter notebook is um, it, it's it's, it's a um, web-based interface to Python primarily um, that lets you create um, notebooks that are comprised from uh, cells. The cells can be either you know textual instructions. Um, mathematical expressions that get kind of pretty printed um, or Python code that you can run. And they're a great way to uh, provide an interactive experience for, for learning new material. Um, they're a great way for people who are doing science and want to share their work or even just to go in and explore, um, um, to explore a new data set and, and kind of uh, fiddle with it, interact with it, um, and and keep records of what they've discovered, so they can keep little notes to yourself. It, it's a they are fabulous environments to work with. Um, so there's a little bit of of information here about the, the user interface for these notebooks. Um, a Google Colab, it is a Jupyter notebook, but they've kind of um, themed it a little bit differently than some of the, the Jupyter notebooks you might have seen, but the essential elements are all there. And, um, and so you will basically see that the, um, the notebook is broken down into cells. Those cells can be either code or text. Um, and in this case here, for example, this is a text cell. If I double click it, you know, I can see right here, um, it uses a markdown, uh, and that gets turned into HTML. If I control, um, or if, they, if there's this little run button there on the Mac. So on, on Linux, and I think on Windows, it's control enter, and on uh, Mac, oops, nope, it, it'll be um, option enter to, to, um, to, to actually run that cell. If you run a text cell, um, it just kind of pretty prints and formats the text. If you run a code cell, it will actually um, run the code in it. Uh, David says uh, shift enter. Cool. Let me just double check that. Yeah, shift enter works great as well. Um, cool. 
Um, so, um, yes. So the, um, the other thing to note is, is when we look at, so here's a cell down here where, um, so if I mouse over it, I get this kind of like run button. But if I mouse off of it, you see that there's a square angle bracket and there's no number in it, which means that it hasn't yet been run. Um, that is a code cell. We will try that shortly. Um, so um, the other things is that there's extensive help available in, uh, you know, it's kind of um, a Python sensitive help available. Um, you can put, you know, a question mark after a function name or something and uh, up will come help for it. Um, there's um, um, some also extra functionality. And if you want, there's some useful tips and techniques available from the links there. And you can click on those and, and review them later. <clears throat> Let's go and just talk about the first thing before we get started um, in, this, in this environment is when you, um, so one of the reasons that we're using Google Colab is it's in the cloud and available to everyone, not just people at Coast. Um, and it also supports GPUs. And because we're doing a lot of image processing here, um, uh, GPUs are essential <laughs> to be able to finish this tutorial um, in time. Um, but by default, the environment does not have a GPU. So there's different uh, kind of, um, configurations. And the first thing that we need to do is click on runtime and go down to change runtime type. And you'll want a hardware accelerator. And the one that you want will be GPU. And we'll click save. And that should, that should be it. And at the top, near the top of the screen, there is, so you should probably not be connected because we haven't done anything really um, in this notebook that requires a Python to run. So there's no kind of kernel, Python kernel in the background. Um, but when we go and run our first cell here, and I'll just mouse over it and click um, the, the sort of run button. Okay, so the first thing it's gonna let us know is when it starts to run is that this wasn't authored by Google. Um, and should we run it? And so I'm gonna say run anyway, because I made the, it and I trust it. And you kind of need to too. Um, so one of the things is that when you run these notebooks in your account, you can mount your drive, uh, your Google Drive, and have access to data files there. And that's how you can like save the notebook to your Google Drive as opposed to download it to your machine. Um, and so whatever notebooks you run would then have access to that. Now, notice as a result of this, so the, um, so if I look at, um, the cell here with my mouse off of it, I see that the, the number one is next to the little square brackets. So that means that that cell ran and it was the first one to run. And if I look up at the very top section um, uh, of the window and I see that where it previously had said like, you know, connect, uh, it actually tells me what sort of connection I have. And, um, and so I can basically see how much RAM I'm using and how much disk space is being used by this. Um, so now I'm actually connected with my environment. And if you are not yet connected, I would encourage you to, um, you, you know, make it known in the Q&A or the chat. Um, so we're going to, so, um, um, so one of the things that we're going to have to do is uh, we need a data set. That's kind of where all the, you know, machine learning type work starts, lots of data. And um, it's kind of the, the fuel for discovery. And so we're going to today use in the, um, in the, in the tutorial part, we're going to use a CIFAR 10 image, a CIFAR 10 data set, which is a data set of color images, 32 by 32. And um, they are from 10 categories, cars, trains, boats, horses, dogs, cats, that sort of thing. And, um, so we're just going to run this next cell, which provides some um, helper functionality. Um, we don't have to worry too much about that. And now we're going to basically go about downloading the data. We're going to use Keras's built-in um, data set. So there's a bunch of standard um, smaller data sets that are available from within Keras itself, and we can use 
uh, Keras to download it. Um, the nice thing when Keras does this is it, it gets cached in a local kind of Keras uh, data sets directory. Um, and so, um, you know, if you're doing this on your home machine, uh, once you've done it once and you try to download it again, it's already there, it's already cached. Um, because every time we spin up a Google uh, a Colab session, we kind of start from an empty environment, everything's cleaned out. It, it's, you know, every time we start this, this notebook, we will have to download it again. So let's click on uh, this download. Now, ignore the, the references to failed. That just means that it, just, it didn't find a cached version locally, but we can see that it is downloading here. Uh, and so, at, at this point of time, um, I've basically, by, by seeing the downloading data and see that it kind of completed, um, that basically tells me that I have this, this data set. And so this is something that's kind of important. So if anyone is not here yet, um, or the data set hasn't yet downloaded, um, please let a, a David know. The, um, and ignore the failed. So that's just to take care of caching the, um, the data. And it just, it wasn't there to begin with. Um, if this notebook, um, there's versions of it that can run in Binder and other environments. And when they, you do, uh, they have those data sets already. And that saves you downloading it. Okay, <clears throat> so maybe we can take a, 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 a quick <clears throat> pause here and does anyone have, um, so is anyone stuck here that the, they don't have their, okay, uh, all working so far nicely, the pace is good, fabulous. Okay, so now we will go on to the next part. Okay, so once you've got your data, the next part is to, um, you know, uh, set up our, our environment, pick a learning framework. In this case, we've picked Keras. Uh, on top of TensorFlow. Um, so TensorFlow is um, a well-regarded framework um, supported, developed by Google. Um, they recently incorporated Keras. So Keras was really a very, very nice um, interface and API for, write, for creating um, deep learning models. And there's, um, it's, um, it's, um, that there is a, uh, it's available actually for PyTorch. You can wrap PyTorch in it and other frameworks. Um, and it used to wrap TensorFlow. So basically they were backends for Keras. But um, with the upgrade uh, to TensorFlow 2, uh, Google decided to make Keras the primary interface uh, to TensorFlow. And it's, it is really very nice and I think very accessible. So we're going to be using it here today. Um, the first thing that we need to do is we need to load a bunch of the libraries and tools that we're going to use. So the first bunch of libraries is kind of, you know, system libraries and pandas and numpy, which we're going to use to read the data sets in and also matplotlib, which is a, a, a graphical plotting library, which we're going to use to help visualize a lot of what's going on in these networks. So we click on that link. And then the next part is we're going to load TensorFlow and Keras. And so now we have these modules imported and we're ready to use them. One of the other things that we're going to do is um, we want to tell Jupyter to display whatever images that the, the plotting library produces in line, in the cell, in the notebook. And that's done with this little magic. Um, so, so the uh, per, per, the percentage um, so, uh, sign before a command is kind of like a magic uh, notebook um, a command. And what this will do is basically let us configure matplotlib to, um, uh, to display the images in line. There's a bunch of other options as well, including um, including um, uh, widgets and, and notebook for interactive widgets, um, which we, we won't use, use, to, use today. So again, what should have happened so far is that you should have run all these cells um, and see you know, the number or the order in which they ran. And now we're just gonna verify that our environment is, is kind of good to go. We're going to run 
this cell here. And what we're going to see is, so the previous cells didn't really produce any output for us. But finally, we're starting to see cells where they're actually going to print some things out. And what you should see is that, yes, we are in CoLab, you know, the TensorFlow version, the Python version. Um, and, if we're, and the important bits here is if it's built with CUDA. So CUDA is a, a library for a, a, a GPU uh, programming, and that's turned on. And we see that there is a GPU available. And if we've got that, you're in great shape. OK. So um, this is kind of an important step. If you've got to this step, um, and you're, you're basically your environment set up, you've got your um, uh, modules uh, loaded, the framework's ready to go, we're ready to begin processing that data. Um, again, if you're not, if you haven't got to here yet, please let uh, uh, um, uh, uh, David know. So, um, before we go on, I want to point out to one little problematic thing right here. There's 53 hidden cells here. Um, if Glenn, you... Yes. Sorry to interrupt. So um, I think everyone needs to change their runtime type. Uh, but th they did that at the beginning. OK, well, then there are some people who have, uh, if you could maybe walk them through not actually changing it, but just show them where to click to do the change. Sure. Yes. There are some people who missed that. OK, so the important thing is to go, go to, so at the beginning, let's go to the beginning of the, the document to show you. There's this setup collab step right here, uh, which tells you what you need to do. And you need to go to the runtime menu at the top and then go down to manage sessions. Oh, sorry, a wrong one. So let me skip that. I made a boo-boo. Uh, runtime and change runtime type. And so um, you need to change this to, to GPU and then click Save. And you may need to restart the kernel if you've already had code running. So um, um, it will, it, Collab should restart the kernel for them. For the because it has to restart everything so that it can then pick up uh, a connection to a GPU. So they'll have to probably reload the data. Yes. Exactly. Uh, and, and then obviously rerun any code cells that they had previously run. Exactly. So what we can do is, uh, so after you've changed it, um, you can go to, um, uh, you can go to restart, if you need to, you can restart runtime. Um, but by the way, you don't want to run all uh, because there's some very, expensive operations in there. And uh, you want to kind of run one at a time because there's some we're gonna skip and there's some you may want to do a little bit of experimenting with and uh, tinker with some values. And so if, there, if things are running, you won't be able to do that. And uh, what happens is that when you, when you run multiple cells, they all get queued up. So if you were to do, to run another cell that you wanted to experiment with something, it would, it would be run last, um, not next. Okay. So if you did, once you've got your a GPU enabled session, um, you will want to basically run all these code cells again, uh, the ones that we run, including the, the downloading the data and, and the setup. And what you should have is by the time you get to here, um, which is how many, how, many, how many cells in, seven cells in, um, you, it should tell you that you have a physical GPU device. And if you do, then, then you're good to go. Um, I want to point out um, something else. Um, so there's a little problem here. We have these cells are hidden. There's actually quite a lot of cells under this, sec under this section. Um, um, so Google Colab, as part of a notebook, it treats it a bit like a book with a table of contents and chapters and so on and, and headings. And as you can see, you can actually jump around these, these, um, these sections and so in, with a table of contents. And, um, and that's available from the left-hand side. You can expand those um, the table of contents is right there. The problem is that if I click this run button here, it's going to run all of them. And I don't want it to run all of them. I want to run a few at a time and see what, what is happening with them. Um, so what I could do is, is click on it and just to unhide them. But probably the best way is to go to view 
and go expand sections. Okay. So does everyone see basically what happened after I um, after I um, expanded the sections? I can now see a lot more of the cells. We can kind of see you know subsections of this like chapter or whatever. Okay. So um, we're just going to verify that we have the data. So we're just going to run this cell again. And we basically see at the end that, um, so there's different versions of this data that, that we could have gotten. Um, so, uh, but sort of the, um, but we see that there is the cached file here at the end. And that's, that's the important bit. And if I go looking for it, we can actually kind of see where it is. <clears throat> uh, Keras puts it under, under your home directory, dot Keras, data sets, and you can see the file right there. So this basically lets us, this um, percent percent bash is basically a way to run bash commands inside a, of, a, of, a, of a cell. And we ran a kind of a simple find command to find where these files were, and that now we know kind of where Keras is putting them. Okay, <clears throat> so um, we're gonna create some helper functions um, to, to basically work with the um, indexes and, 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 and labels. So the first thing, so in the data set itself, the categories are just numbers, um, but they actually, they're like dogs and cats and things like that. So what I've done is just created a list here um, <clears throat> of the different categories so that I can have a nice textual output of those. And then there's some helper functions that basically are going to, you know, given an index, they're going to um, uh, kind of return uh, uh, the label names and so on. And so we're gonna run that. These are just helper utilities. And, um, and now we're ready to actually load the data into memory. So let me just check where we're at. So, um, so someone asked, uh, Ahmed asked about uh, Keras models. So Keras is, a, is in this case is a wrapper over TensorFlow. So it's just an API and we're going to basically see it um, in, in, in action. And we're also going to create models with it. <clears throat> so, but we, do, we have a few more cells to go through. We have to kind of load the data up first and explore it. Um, but we will get to that uh, uh, later on. So the first thing to do is to load this data set. And so we're gonna run this cell. Um, and what we're doing is uh, we're, call it, we're, we're basically using the built-in you know, CIFAR 10 data set. We're loading it up. And um, I, I know kind of the format of the data that it returns. Um, it returns uh, two tuples, and each tuple has um, a data part and a label part. And the first tuple is the training data, and then the second tuple is the testing data. And what will happen is that when we, when we use the training data to do the training, but after we're done, we want to test, we want, we, we, these, the test data is kind of withheld from training and we want to use that to get a good sense of what has our network actually learned. Because one of the issues is, is that if the network is big enough, it can just memorize all the data, but not really learn anything new. And so when, when we train a network and create a model, we will want to use it on data that we haven't seen before. So by, by withholding some of that data for testing, uh, we kind of get a sense of how this model might perform in actual use as opposed to just while we're training. So, um, so we might have a bunch of questions here, like what is X train and Y train? What do they look like? What sort of data types are they? You know, things like that. Um, so, um, we're going to answer those questions and I'm going to run this next cell as well, which is just a way to confirm that the data actually was, was loaded. Um, so if you get to this part here and it says data loaded, we're good. We can now go on to exploring the data. Cool. So 
<clears throat> one of the things that we can do is because we can use those notebooks interactively is, you know, once we've loaded the data up, we can actually, you know, directly use that data. Th th those, those variables that were assigned to up here are available in, in, in the following cells. And so I'm going to print out a bunch of things about this. So for example, I'm interested in the training uh, uh, types um, and their shapes. So I'm going to look at the, at the type. I'm going to, for, for both the, the training, um, both the, um, the data part and the label part. So typically the, the, the training data is called like the X and the um, labels are the Y because it, we can kind of think of it as that we're trying to create a function that given some data from X, it produces answers from Y, um, a, a little, like a function. And um, um, so I also want to look at the data types as well. Um, you know, what type of numbers format are they? Uh, are they floats or the integers? I also want to look at the shape, which is important because when we build these, um, um, these networks, it's basically like fitting Lego pieces together and the shapes have to match up. Um, and so we kind of want to see what the shape of the data is so that we know uh, what our model um, inputs must be like. And we'll do this for the train and, and for the test um, and print a few things out about them. Okay, <clears throat> so what I see when I run this is that um, the type of the data set is a NumPy array. So NumPy is uh, a numerical a math library uh, for um, for Python, that's high performance, and the back end, it's, it's C. Um, I see that also the Y type is also a, a NumPy array, and Keras can read these directly. The, um, um, the data type for the data is unsigned integer eight. So that's like a, that's like a, a byte. So uh, we can represent numbers from zero to 255. So 250, 256 different numbers is what we can represent. And similarly for the, um, the, 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 the Y data as well. Although as it turns out later on, we won't be using all those, those values that we could represent. Um, we also look at, at the shape of the, this data and what we see is it's actually four dimensional. The first dimension is the uh, number of examples. So there's 50,000 examples here, and the each example is three dimensionals. Three dimensionals. It's um, X, Y, and and a channel or or a color. You can think of it as like red, green, blue. Um, the uh, the Y data or the labels <clears throat> is the same size, and that kind of makes sense because you know for every input. Uh, data example, you need a corresponding label value for it. And, um, but there's only one dimension here because it turns out it's just going to be a, a number. And similarly for the, the test shapes, we notice that there are fewer tests because you don't need as many to get a sense of how much you've learned. Um, you tend to want as much data as possible in the learning set. But there's enough here to basically give us to evaluate um, how well we've trained, but we notice that the each data example is the same size, and similarly for the test, and we basically we see how many uh, samples there are in each. Let's go run that next cell, <clears throat> and what we're going to do now is just look at <clears throat> what is the data inside these um, um, inside each of these arrays, and so we see for the X, we see that the lowest number is zero the largest is 255, and that the, the um, mean value is 120 or so. And for, for the, uh, the label values, uh, we see that they seem to go from zero to, to nine. So, you know, we've, so we now have kind of a sense of, at a low level, what our input data is going to be like. And what we can do is we can maybe get a visual sense of what our data looks like. So let's go in and create a little uh, plotting um, because, you know, 
what's in there is supposed to be images, but we haven't seen them yet. So we don't know what we're working with. Let's create a little helper uh, function, which is going to basically go through about 40 images um, and, and show them using the, the, the plot library that we had pre um, imported previously. So this is just a helper. Uh, we'll run this next one, this, which is actually calls this function. And what we now see is the first little sample of what's in our data set. So we see the images that make up the, the X um, test, and then we see the labels converted from numbers into the you know, nice English labels. Um, and we can see, yes, okay, automobile's an automobile, bird's a bird, ship is a ship, horse is a horse, and there's deers in there. And so now you get a sense of, um, you know, some of the challenges with this data set. It, the, the resolution is very low. And some things are easy to pick out. Some things may, may be hard, like, you know, that dog at the bottom um, is almost kind of cat-like in a way. Um, now, because it does it randomly, you will have different examples. And if you were to rerun the cell, you would kind of randomly pick a bunch of different examples. Um, so you can kind of explore what things look like. The next thing that we can do is we can kind of look at the histogram. So we know that the, you know, the, the, the data ranges are from zero to 255, and there's a, a mean of 120, which is kind of near the middle. But you know, how are the, the values distributed? And so here's a little um, histogram plot helper. And we can look at our training data with this. <clears throat> And what we see on the Y histogram, we can basically see, well, there's about 5,000 examples of each. So for each label, there's 5,000 examples, which makes sense because there's 50,000 total. And there's 10 labels. And so we basically know that um, of all of the classes we have, we have an equal number of, um, for each type. So one of the issues is when you're looking at a data set, um, if you, some classes are underrepresented, like they just don't have enough data for that particular type, um, it's easy for the network just to ignore it because you know you don't lose a whole lot by always saying no, it's not this, no, it's not this class, right? So, you know, having sufficient data for all the uh, categories is an important uh, feature of a of a data set, and we can also look at at the histogram of the um, the data values in the um, in the in the in the in the uh, X uh, data set and we can kind of see this close to normal distribution here we can see that you know um, many of the so, so basically this means that many of the images have a lot of you know white shows up quite predominantly um, black a little bit less so and then the other values in between, you know, we tend to get kind of mi middle saturation, middle intensity colors. <clears throat> What's important though, is that the test set and the training set, so that the, the uh, training set and the test set, that they are from a similar, um, um, the, from a similar distribution. And we, and we see that as well, the, the distribution of values in the test set looks very much like the te like the, the training set. And so, you know, we're actually going to be testing a similar distribution against what we're learning, but some different examples. Okay. <clears throat> so we now have a, a, a sense of some statistical qualities of our data set, and we've seen it a little bit. Um, one of the things that we can do to, to kind of, um, explore the data is, you know, so um, <clears throat> we may be able to figure out from the, the raw data itself uh, what the labels should actually be. So if you think of like a, a linear regression problem, <clears throat> the, um, you know, with some kind of um, simple statistical analysis, uh, you might find how the X and the Y values kind of relate to each other. Um, as this relationship becomes more complex, 
that's when you know deep networks become more useful. Um, so the first um, the first sort of go to um, way to explore this data set is with principal component analysis. And we'll just, there's a bunch of helper cells here, which we're, uh, not helper cells, but we're going to actually um, use um, scikit-learn to create uh, the, the PCA, uh, the principal component analysis um, components. <clears throat> and we're going to subsample those as well. And we're going to create a little helper here, which is to plot those values. And let's go and see what those principal components are. So, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what we're seeing. <clears throat> so, um, <clears throat> maybe just talk a little bit about images and a different perspective on what you can think of as, as an image. So let's say that you have a um, 20 by 20 image of a face, like, you know, a passport photo. So there's 400 pixels, and basically in there is a face, and those 400 pixels just describe what a face looks like. But you can also think of that uh, image as a point, a single point, not like a 400 points of, of different intensities, but a single point in a very high dimensional space, in this case, a 400 dimensional space. And now what we can do is we can think about changing the, um, the um, dimensions on which the, um, uh, on which this um, point is represented. So instead of the, the, the typical um, uh, pixel um, dimensions, we can think about uh, the dimensions in which the pixel values tend to vary the most. What's the most important thing about, um, about, let's say, a face? Well, one might just be, you know, the oval component to it. So that might be, that, that so if you have a, a dimension for this oval component, you know, you can describe a lot of faces um, with just that. You know, you're missing a lot of the details, but the essential elements are there. And, and then the next dimension might be, you know, how the face gets separated out into, um, you know, kind of shadowy, darker areas around the eyes, lighter on the top, darker around the mouth, that sort of thing, shiny in the middle. And so you have another dimension that's basically, you know, maybe where the eyes and the mouth, nose and the mouth tend to situate and the sort of color intensity values that they tend to take on. And now you are able to describe, um, maybe a very blurry face, but a kind of face-like thing with only two dimensions, right? Uh, which is a you know a savings of 400 dimensions. So that's basically what the principal com components do is they break down you know a high dimensional vector space into a, a, a new vector space in which the um, dimensions now represent kind of more important features. And if we look at how our data set got break broken down, <clears throat> we can basically see that. Um, um, the the kind of essential the sorts of features that show up most commonly are is that there's something at the center of the image, and then some sort of background. And it may be that the center is dark and the background is lighter, or that the center is um, um, uh, light and the background is dark. <clears throat> and then as we start going along, we see that the kind of the frequency. Um, you know, we start to go from, you know, one or two kind of blobs to, to multiple blobs. And basically, the, the frequency um, that is represented on these different components is going to get, it's going to increase. And basically, it's going to be able to represent finer and finer detail in the images. Now, what might not be entirely obvious from this is that if you take any of the images from that original data set, um, you know, of course, one way to represent them is in this image space where each dimension is just one of the pixels. 
but you could actually represent them in this uh, component space as well. And the, um, and you basically you would take kind of a weighted sum of all these image components and you would be able to rebuild perfectly that original image. Now, one of the cool things though, is that you can, um, because the higher frequency uh, components um, provide kind of less and less information as you go, uh, as the frequency becomes higher, um, the essential components tend to come earlier and you can basically uh, reduce the number of dimensions and just keep these earlier dimensions and still get up, still get you know a reasonable representation but that just gives you a sense of um you know it kind of matches a little bit with what we kind of expect to see that because a lot of these images have one object and that object is at the center there being something at the center of an image is kind of you know really important um we can also go and um do a, a a scatter plot of these, the first two uh, categories. <clears throat> okay, so what are we looking at here? So this is from the principal component net analysis, um, and we're just taking the first two components, which are supposedly like the most important components there. And what we, so this is a way to represent a very high dimensional space in a lower dimensional space. And what we, what we see, just by kind of eyeballing it, is that whatever this data set is representing, things don't fall apart into nice categories that easily, okay? We see that, yes, there is some separation, so we can see by colors here, which is basically the, the, the category itself, um, we can see that um, maybe category nine and zero, tending more down toward the bottom, and some of these six and four categories tend to be more up to the top left. Um, so they're starting to separate out a little bit. There are some differences that we can see just from those first two components, um, but not a lot, not enough to be able to, let's say, do like a K-means classifier. Um, we can also look at a 3D view, which is basically gives us um, a, um, uh, gives us this, the third component there. And again, um, they don't really separate out that, that nicely yet. The data set is, is, is more complex than some sort of initial um, analysis would allow us to just discover anything about. Um, by the way, this 3D graph can be made interactive and you can kind of move it around if you choose, um, you know, matplotlib widgets or some, something else beside inline. Um, so there's another uh, visualization technique um, that's quite popular <clears throat> um, called TISNY, um, which is another way to represent very high dimensional data and convert it into lower dimensional data that you can, you can visualize. Um, and it works in a different way from PCA and it 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 um, it helps to um, basically find it, it basically preserves certain properties that exist in the high dimensional space, which is your neighbors. So who and we'll we'll talk about that in a bit. But let's just go and just run these examples here. <clears throat> this one here is um, we're going to create a. Um, um, scikit-learn pipeline. Uh, first of all, we're going to de decompose. Uh, so Disney can be quite slow. So we're going to decompose um, the domain using PCA first and uh, and only and just sample some of the data. So let's click on that. And now we're going to and now we're going to run um, this uh, a, a Tisney pipeline, which is going to basically try to find uh, the lower dimensional embedding. So while that's running, let me just talk a little bit about what, what Tisney is doing, and also in a way what the network is going to be doing that we, we're going to build. So, <clears throat> what you can think of, imagine if you had you know a piece of paper that you had 
colored, you know, red on one side and blue on the other. And so this exists kind of in three-dimensional space, right? And if you were asked to separate out the red from the blue, it would be very easy just to draw a line, a very simple line that separates them out, okay? So this is an example of a, of a data set where the original representation is, is actually kind of closely related to also the, the categories that exist there. And so it's very easy to go from one to the other. And so traditional machine learning approaches could work quite nicely. But imagine if you crumple this paper up, okay? And, and um, you crumple it up, it's still in 3D space, and you're asked to, to basically describe some sort of shape that, um, that's, that, that separates out the two categories, the red from the blue. In that case, it becomes very hard. You just can't, you can't cut a nice plane. You may not even be able to you know, create a very strange surface to do this. It'd be very, very hard. What you kind of want to do is you want to, you know, kind of uncrumple that paper back into some simple space. And one way that you can think about this is that, you know, if you have paper that's folded over each other, okay, and so let's say you have red at the top and then blue at the bottom, the distance from the red to the, to, to, to the, to the blue may be quite small, right? So if you're looking for, um, like, you know, K, K means clustering, for example, which depends on distance. Distance really isn't a good metric of, um, of the categories. But if you look in this, very local to this area here, the closest neighbor to you know, these red dots are going to be other red dots, right? And so instead of going, what's the distance from you know, here to here, you basically look at how many neighbors do I have to go through to get to this other point? So you're basically kind of following the paper. And that's kind of what, what Tisney is, is doing. Um, and what we get out of Tisney is a lower dimensional visual representation. We start to see maybe better uh, clustering than we did previously. Uh, we see that um, there's a little better locality in it, but it's still not quite good. It, it's still, there's still a lot of overlap. We, we won't be able to like just look at this 2D space and distinguish whether something is a deer or a cat or a car or a truck. Um, <clears throat> we may get, you know, so-so, but it's gonna be challenging. Um, in tomorrow's exercise, when you do this for yourself, there's also these TISNI and PCA examples uh, <clears throat> built into that notebook for you. But you'll be working with a simpler black and white data set. And in, in those cases, the output is um, a little more, it's more, more interesting. It, the, the, the clusters really kind of stand out. So, um, but that gives you a sense of, <clears throat> You know, you want to see how complex is this data. And, you know, if, if you can't, if the simple techniques for, uh, for clustering, for example, don't work, <clears throat> that's one of the more complex and capable techniques like deep learning, which can kind of, you know, uncrumple the paper bit by bit um, and separate the categories out, start to become more important. We're going to skip over the next, the 3D example, because it just takes too long to run, and it doesn't really give us much more information either. Um, <clears throat> so, how are we doing? It's, we're an hour in or so. We've spent a lot, a lot of time with data, which actually is not uncommon uh, for machine learning and deep learning. Um, in many cases, you know, the data sets are already kind of pre-processed and made, but when you work with data sets that um, you may be developing yourself or, um, or maybe processed from other raw data sources, um, understanding them and massaging them into the shape that the network needs is an important step. So one of the things that we saw previously about this data set is 
that the number ranges uh, were between zero and 255. <clears throat> but the neural networks prefer things in the range, you know, zero to one or negative one to one, in part because their activation functions tend to peak out uh, near one. <laughs> and, um, and if the input values are not normalized into these kind of nice, these smaller ranges, um, it can slow down learning considerably. So we basically want to process these data sets, which are um, kind of integers, you know, pixel values, um, into floats, uh, and, and then floats that range over like zero to one. So this is what these cells are going to do. Um, <clears throat> We're going to, so we're going to find out the number of classes, which we kind of already knew when we looked at the data, but we're going to put that into a variable, which we will see come up a number over and over again. Um, we're also going to change those data sets um, to, uh, to, to, to a one, one hot encoding. In this case, we use a function called two uh, categorical. So, so here's the reason that we do that. So, um, uh, so the so the, so the the label values are zero to nine, and I think like zero is airplane, and um, so I think they have an ex example here. Uh, so we just we discuss one hot so so the, the the notes to the one hot coding are in previous, but I'll explain what it is here. So let's say that we have. Um, car as number three and bird as number four. So um, those numbers represent these two categories, but what does 3.5 mean? Is it a half bird, half car? So we want to, to, to basically create a dimensional space where um, we can kind of make an estimate of how much of a car is it, right? If, if, if we just keep the original representation, which is, which is just a categorical, categorical number for each label, how do we say, you know, how car-like this is? You know, because if we make the number a little bit smaller, we just, we end up moving into some sort of different category. So these one hot encodings, basically for every category, we end up with another dimension. So, um, in this case, there's 10 dimensions for 10, 10 different categories. We will now end up with a vector from, um, uh, that, that has size 10. And if, for example, we had uh, an automobile, let's say it was three or something like that, then what would happen is that all the values in the vector for that label would be zero except for the kind of third dimension, which would be for automobiles. And then it would be set to one. So that's why we call it one hot, because like one of, the, one of them has one and all the rest have zeros. And it also allows us later on to kind of um, describe kind of a probability distribution over the different values. You know, how confident are we at it's a car? Well, 0.5, how confident are we that it's a truck? 0.25, you know? <clears throat> And it lets us um, be able to, to, to represent something that we couldn't with these original categories. So that's what this two categorical does, is it creates this one hot encoding. The next thing that we need to do is to normalize the data onto, into floats and an over the range um, zero to one. So what we basically do is we convert the data types into floats um, and divide by 255, which uh, we kind of knew from before what that value was. That's the, the maximum value. And we do that both for the training and, and the test set as well. And now if we go and look at these values, we see that we're still dealing with NumPy arrays, but the data type is now a float, not an int. And it's actually now four times bigger because floats are four bytes instead of one. Um, the training shape and the and the test shapes remain the same, which is to be expected. Um, but you know the values in there are going to be different. But but um, the the label shapes have changed. So before there were just there was like you know five thousand 
training labels, that didn't change, but there was only one dimension. That was that category, enum. E but in this case, we now have 10 dimensions, you know, one for each category. That's the, the one hot encoding. Okay. <clears throat> Now we're ready to get into the actual modeling of, of this data. And so what I want to do is I want to start off with a pre-trained uh, data set. So CIFAR 10 is actually you know, a fairly small data set. There's, a, there's, other, there's um, um, other data sets, this VGG 16, so sorry, there's other models that have been trained on much larger data sets. So we're gonna look at one called uh, VGG16 that is trained on um, ImageNet, which is uh, a large <clears throat> data set uh, with many different uh, categories. Uh, the resolution is also higher. And so we kind of, so, and, and it can take many, many hours to, to train. Um, especially on a single GPU. It's, it's a substantial data set. There's a lot of information in there about what, what images uh, contain. And so what we're going to do is we're going to um, basically load that model. There's a pre-trained model. Um, so basically it's a network and we're gonna see what it looks like soon uh, and see why it's called a deep network. And it's being, pre-trained, so all the layers in that network have weights um, that basically represent knowledge about how to dissect an image into features that we can then use for classification. So let's click on uh, cache models, um, ignore the failed. Um, it, it's um, um, uh, the, the downloading should have already happened or the downloading will. So let's run this next one. I think here, there we go. Now the downloading is happening. Okay. So we now have this, um, um, this neural network. It's a convolutional neural network and made from a bunch of layers. And I'll explain a bit about what is going on here. <clears throat> so like um, computer scientists, we kind of like drawing things upside down. Trees start at the root and go down to the leaves. And in this case here, um, the network is, you may often see them kind of drawn horizontally left to right. Um, and here this graph goes top to bottom, but we start with the um, input layer. This is where we put our images in. Um, we end up basically with convolutional layers. So there's a layer of, 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 of convolutional kernels. This feeds into another layer of convolutional kernels. And then we have a max pooling layer. And I'll explain briefly what those mean, but we kind of see that this pattern kind of repeats for multiple layers, quite a few all the way to the end. Now this isn't the end of this VGG network, but it's the end of the one that we're interested in. It's, it's the kind of the convolutional part of it, not the categorization part. Because we, we're not interested in the, how, in the ImageNet categories, we're interested in the C410 categories. So there's quite a few layers in there. It's, it's, it's quite deep. So what are convolutional layers? Well, um, so um, uh, a convolutional kernel is basically a small pattern that represents a feature. It's a, basically a way to look around locally and, um, and see if locally you have this feature. Um, so we will see more examples later on of what this is visually. Um, but you could think of it, for example, as an edge detector where, um, or, or a dot de detector. Um, and you're basically using like cosine similarity with a you know, dot product. You're passing this over uh, each part of the image. And for each part of the image, you're kind of saying, um, you know, do I see this feature or not? Or, or rather, how much of this feature do I see here? And in this way, you produce a new image, but that image is 
um, the numbers that come out of it are um, the numbers that come out of it, the, 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 the convolution is how much of that feature you see. <clears throat> so there's, there's one of the reasons that um, image processing made such a big advance. So one that, that uh, deep learning uh, image processing made such a big advancement is because of convolutional layers. And the reason being is that the convolutional kernels themselves are small, so there's only a few weights to train. And the other reason is that um, the same kernel gets trained at each location in the image. So um, in, in fully connected dense uh, layers, uh, which is kind of the traditional neural network approach, you basically whatever is important, whatever is whatever interesting image feature you need to, that, that you need to use, you kind of have to relearn it over and over again. But with uh, the convolutions, you basically have you have a smaller thing to learn, which is the small convolutional kernel, and it gets to see many thousands of times more data because it's it's not just seeing one image it's seeing all the places of the image over and over again. So, you know, if you have a 20 by 20 image, which is it's very, very small, you'd have, uh, or, or let's say the 32 by 32, which is what the CIFAR is, you basically have a thousand times increase in the, in the, in the number of data that these convolutional kernels uh, are learning about. So basically you get more data, less to learn and better performance. Now, at some point, when you're searching for a particular feature, you kind of want to know, is it there or not? So, um, um, and you kind of want to make, so when, when you run the, um, the convolution over all the, the image, the result is essentially uh, another image of the same size. With uh, but the but the values of this new image are actually how much of this feature shows up there, and um, if you kept doing this, you'd basically end up with um, a um, you know you you'd basically keep the original image size all the way through the network, but you're kind of interested not really on the details about you know where is this feature. You're just interested in is this feature here? You know, did you find it somewhere here? And that's what this max pooling is doing. So the max pooling, if you have like two by two, basically it takes four you know, nearby um, pixels in the feature image, and basically it takes the maximum value, which is that corresponds to, did you find the feature? What is the best evidence you found for that feature in this region? And as a result, you now shrink the size of the image down by four, but you know, half on each side. Um, and now you have a smaller image. And by the time you get to the end of the network, you're looking at a very small image, um, maybe even just one pixel with like, did you find this feature there or didn't you, right? So that's what that max pooling is doing. The other thing that we can do is look at a summary, a text summary. <clears throat> of um, this is basically similar to the diagram that we just saw, uh, but instead of being you know, graphical, it's shown in text with some additional information. So we see these convolutional layers and the max pooling layers. We see that they have names and we also see the shape that comes out of them. So a little bit of an explanation here. Uh, remember the original shape for our data set, which was like 50,000 the 32, 32, 3. Well, that 50,000 was the size of the data set. Um, here, we see it represented with none, which basically means that it's going to be a kind of a varied size. It's going to end up being the batch size, which is how much you can fit in the GPU at once. Um, so later on, when you see batch size, that, that, that value is going to be um, passed in here and propagated through the entire network. Uh, but when the output shape says none, it basically means it's going to be provided by the input. So it's like a dynamic value. The other thing that we see here is the number of, um, so uh, we see the number of parameters, which is the number of weights that we have to learn 
or in this case, we don't have to learn, they were already pre-trained. And we also see for the convolutionum, we see that um, this value here says that there's 64 um, convolution kernels. So we're gonna look for 64 different features at this level of the network. And it's gonna produce a 32 by 32 um, image, or it's gonna be a feature image. And, and again, the next layer that builds is gonna be a feature detector of a feature detector, right? It still produces the same size, but when we get to the max pooling, um, we are going to, uh, we're going to basically reduce that image size and we're gonna end up with an image you know, for each of those convolutional kernels that came before. And then as we decrease the um, size of the image, we are going to add in more convolutional kernels. This gives us, increases the ability of us to find more interesting features. And, um, and because as we get, because as, we, as we're reducing the size of the image, we're looking for higher level features, features that don't just describe, you know, like edges or very simple local features, but maybe more global features, like do you see an eye here? Or later on, do you see a face here? This sort of thing. And finally, you know, do you see a cat here? And so we can see that the number of uh, convolutional kernels increases as we go up the network, but as the size of the, those feature images decreases. And we again see that the number of um, uh, weights or parameters um, is increasing as well. At the end, we get a total number, about 14 million um, uh, parameters or almost 15 million. But the cool thing is we didn't have to train them. Okay, let's just um, find out some more about the layers that are here. We're going to look at, <clears throat> so convolutional base is actually a model. It's already, already made for us. We've seen its shape. We've seen how it splits apart into layers. We can access those layers as arrays. And if we look at the first one, uh, which is the input, we can actually find out what, what the input does it take and I find out what its shape is. And we basically see that this uh, matches um, the uh, shape of the input data that we already had. One interesting thing though, is that the, 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 the type for this is a TensorFlow uh, tensor, but whereas we had NumPy arrays. But the thing is, is that uh, these frameworks provide, can convert back and forth automatically. Um, it's, it's better when we don't um, <clears throat> uh, because it's more efficient to kind of keep to one, not, not to the conversion, but for us, it's, today it's fine. <clears throat> and we see that this kind of matches what we are prepared to give to this. So let's go and just understand a bit more about this model and the, the weights that are inside of it. So we're going to... Um, um, uh, run some cells here that are going to um, create some helper functions for visualizing it, um, <clears throat> including some helper functions that let us get a particular layer in the um, in the in the in the in the in the network. Uh, <clears throat> those that let us uh, visualize the convolution kind of layer weights themselves. This is just a helper um, here that let us visualize <clears throat> what the convolutional kind of layers output. And these helper functions are going to help us um, figure out what features in the in in an, in an image would make these convolutional kernels activate most highly. So what you can see here is that we have a, a gradient tape, and we're basically going backwards. It's kind of like training the network backwards. So instead of um, instead of putting an input image and trying to train it to learn a category, we're basically saying, we're going into the middle of the network, we're going, okay, here's one neuron, it's, it's represents by a kernel, by a convolutional kernel, and I want you to create the, the image um, that, that activates this kernel the most. And so what happens is that you kind of repeatedly train, you start off with a, input image that's kind of random a little bit, and then you basically 
try changing it based off the gradient as to how it maximizes that particular kernel. And in doing so, you get an image that has features that this kernel really likes. Now, <clears throat> understanding them is going to be a little bit tricky because um, you know, if the kernel, let's say, likes looking at an eye, then you know, the image space may be quite large and an eye may be fairly small. So if one eye is good, well, then two eyes is even better and you get like, a, there's a whole bunch of eyes. But it gives you a sense of what this kernel really likes. So we'll go in and, and run that cell. Did we, did we run it? You already, already ran it. And this next one here basically um, a, a does the visualization for us. So let's go and run this first um, visualization, which is of the kernels themselves. <clears throat> so what we see is we see the convolutional la the layer that we're at. So we start at the bottom and work our way up or <laughs> down as the case may be. So these are very early convolutions. And what you can kind of see is that they like they're looking for maybe things at an angle or, um, so here's one that the, these two here seem to like to find, you know, dark spots surrounded by light. So the dots all separated by, by themselves. Um, <clears throat> this one here might be like to find, what does it like? Uh, let's, let's find one that we can kind of make, make sense of. Um, so this one here actually looks a little bit like an edge detector. So it likes, you know, bright, dark, bright. So it'll, it'll find, um, you know, where you go from one, um, uh, you, you, basically there's a, a separation or a distinction uh, and it's a vertical distinction. And you might get some which um, like horizontal or, or angles. That's kind of the intuitions here. As you go up the layers, it gets a little bit harder to figure out quite what they're looking for because they're looking at features of features and it's basically they're looking at how the, the features are related to each other, right? Um, but, that gets, but, the, but what you do see is that all the kernels are three by three, they're quite small. So they look at a very local area um, in the image or the feature space. <clears throat> So let's look at, at what they're kind of doing to, to the image. So let's start off with this random image. In my case, let's start off with this automobile. And we're going to apply these convolutions and see what it is that they're going to do to the image. So, um, so here's an example where we're kind of generally interested in the um, image, but we're definitely not interested in this guy's shirt for whatever reason. Um, not that interested in the car as much as we are, let's say, in its windows or its tires. Um, let's find another one. So we can see, so here's an interesting one here where the things that are the brightest are like where you have edges, um, where you change um, so, so from dark to light, it looks like going from right to left. <clears throat> and, and as we go up the layers, we can see what's happening with the max pooling. The, these images are becoming smaller. So th the images stay the same size here. We're drawing them the same size, but you can see that they become more pixelated, um, which means that they have fewer pixels. They're, they're, they're actually smaller. And as we go up or, or, or um, higher up into the network, we see that, you know, we get, um, you know, so whatever was originally here, you could look back, look for that in the original image and try to get a sense of what it, 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 it might, might be looking for. Um, this one seems to be interested in backgrounds, not so inter much interested in the car, um, you know, th th things like that. So let's go and now look at what features um, these convolutional layers really respond to. So 
So this is going to take a little, little while because we actually are kind of doing training already here. It's just it's backwards. But we can look at these early uh, layers. And so for each uh, convolutional kernel, <clears throat> these are the things that it likes. And so <clears throat> it looks like kind of wavy patterns, but really it's kind of like about edges, um, you know, edges at particular angles. And, and again, this uh, the second convolutional layer, also about edges um, um, at, at different angles. Once we start going up into the higher levels, we start seeing more more patterns, um, more like um, um, you know, it, it likes to see things that are um, uh, are, are stippled or, or, or textured as opposed to uh, just kind of, you know, things at, at, at an angle. There's a lot of angles there too. Um, and, that, and that one's just still, still running. So we will skip that next step because that's even higher levels. But if you want to on your own sometime in the future, you can come back to this. Um, if you've ever seen the, um, you know, deep dream type images with, you know, rainbow dogs with lots of eyes everywhere. That's kind of what these higher levels start to start to, to, to like. They like to, like to see more coherent images where you, there's different features like the eyes and the ears and that sort of thing are, um, are um, kind of related to each other in a coherent way. And so we start to see as we get up in these convolution layers, the sorts of things that they like to see become kind of more complex textures, more complex relationships of, of things in, in the original image. Okay, so that concludes that. <clears throat> okay, now we, so we've got our model, we've, um, um, our, our base model, you know, so this, we've got, we've a neural network that was already created, already trained, um, we've seen what it has learned, what its convolutional kernels like, uh, um, what values they have, what they're looking for. <clears throat> um, but what we want, though, is we want to be able to um, categorize images from our CIFAR 10 data set. So to do that, we need to build um, our own network, but we're going to use this other network as a base, which is why we call it a convolutional base. Um, so this convolutional base understands a lot about images already, but it doesn't understand CIFAR 10 because it was never trained on that. So we need basically what we want to do is we want to take this base and on top of it, we're going to put a, um, uh, a classification network. And um, so let's go and explore how we're going to do this. So <clears throat> that's what this next cell is about. So the first thing that we do is I'm going to put this all inside a function. And the reason being is that this allows me in the future, later on in the notebook, to, to create you know, different um, networks, uh, um, different copies of the network that are of the same type. So um, you might see examples where this is not inside a function. They, they, they just do this directly. They build the model directory directly. That's totally cool. The essential bit is that this function returns the model that we create. Um, <clears throat> so how do we go about this? Well, we're going to pass in the convolutional base. Um, and if we didn't, I'm just going to basically that code that we did before where we imported the, um, um, the base of that BGG16 network trained on ImageNet and shaped to the size, we're going to basically create that ourselves. One of the important things about this though, is that we're going to set it, sorry, to be not trainable. So we don't want to retrain this lower level network because one, it already was trained. And two, um, our data set has much less image information in there than the ImageNet data set did. So if we started to train this, this previous network that already was trained, it would lose a lot of knowledge because it just wouldn't see these, the examples that it had seen in the ImageNet data set. So that's why we don't want to train it. <clears throat> um, 
we're going to train this other part though. So what we're going to do is on top of this, uh, we're going to add a classification network. So um, let's start with how Keras creates uh, models. There's two different styles, uh, but we're going to start with a simple style, which is sequential, which is how you can make very simple, you know, layer after layer after layer type models, which are quite common. So we're going to create a sequential model. And as you can see, sequential was imported from models. <clears throat> and then we're just going to add to it. The first thing, the first layer that we're going to add is the convolutional base. Now, that convolutional base had many, many layers itself, but we can think of it as, you know, a single layer. It has an input, it has an output, and we don't have to worry about what's happening inside. The next thing that we have to do is, so we, we, we saw how that VGG, that convolutional base network, that it was producing smaller and smaller uh, th uh, 3D images or, or um, multiple dimensional images. <clears throat> but what we want to do is we want to have the input to our classification be just a single flat dense array. And that's what this flatten does. So this flatten is a layer. And so you can see that it came from you know, Keras import layers. Um, and then after the flatten, um, we want to uh, add an, a dense layer. So that's, so basically the flatten is just a conversion operation. There's nothing to learn in there. It just reorganizes uh, the, the data. The next part though is a layer that we are going to train. And, they, and the standard approach with layers is that you have the weights, the activations, the weights, the activations. And so dense is a certain configuration of these weights. Um, it has 512 weights and they're all densely connected to the previous layer. And then we're going to use uh, um, a ReLU activation, which is kind of a, um, a, a, a kind of a, um, um, is, is linear uh, after you get to zero and and zero and, and basically, so basically it truncates all negative values to zero and then keeps whatever value you have um, for, um, for, 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 for positive activations. And so this gives us the nonlinearity uh, that we need to, to, to make the network kind of unwrap that paper. Um, but it also has good performance characteristics and we don't have to worry about normalizing the, the weights we're learning to keep us in a good training range the way that we would for uh, sigmoids <coughs> or, or 10H. So there's the, the, um, the dense layer, the activation. We then add another layer that's, that's useful, a dropout layer. Um, and the dropout layer um, basically um, um, <clears throat> as we train, it will, um, it, it, so basically it's going to prevent um, the network from, from overfitting or overlearning because the neurons don't always get to participate. So they don't always see all the data. What, when the network's training, we have a few minutes and I'll come back to what that dense network is doing, or that dropout um, is doing. And then finally, <clears throat> we get one final dense layer, <clears throat> which is the number of classes. And we saw that right near the beginning where we kind of looked at our labels and found out how many labels, different types of labels were there. And there was 10 because there was 10 categories. So basically we're going from a 512 dense um, layer into a 10 um, neuron dense layer. And that's gonna be the categorization layer. <clears throat> so in this case, the activation that we want to use is a softmax, which is how we deal with categorization problems. And basically it does, it's, um, it, it basically turns the, the uh, categorizations into a probability distribution uh, that gives us kind of an estimate of how confident we are in these different values. And that is our model. So we're going to run that now we haven't created the model yet. We just created the function that creates them. 
but that's what it's doing. <clears throat> and so we're gonna create our first model here by calling this function with the convolutional base that we created previously. And what we see here when we print out the summary <clears throat> is we see that we have this VGG16 layer, which is that base convolutional network with the 15 million parameters, which we don't train, but we do have to compute over. And then we end up with this smaller um, uh, classification layers at the top. <clears throat> and if we look, the total number of parameters, you know, almost 15 million, but the number of, of trainable ones is only like 270,000 um, and, you know, 14 million non-trainable. So now we get to the training part. <clears throat> so we want to, to train this model because there's this classification network that doesn't know what's going on and we want to tell it, we, we want it to learn how to figure out the CIFAR classifications. So before we get to that, there's some kind of hyperparameters for models that affect how the training goes. So batch size is, is important. Um, <clears throat> typically, you'll want to, so you want a batch size as big as you can that fits on the GPU. So this, this basically describes how much data you process at once. Um, and I, here I've chosen a nice value. It fits on the GPUs, gets good performance. Um, <clears throat> I don't think it uses the, the GPUs completely, um, but because we're working in the cloud, we don't want to, um, we don't know how much memory is being allocated. At Kaust, when we work in IBEX, uh, our, you know, our like a V100 GPUs are, have very large memory. And so we'll want to increase the batch size. And <clears throat> when you do that, you have to also change other aspects like the learning rate as well and, and decay. <clears throat> so, the epochs is the number of basically times you go through your data set. Each time you see the entire data set, that's an epoch. And um, as you'll see, as you train, the network is better and better and better. And at some point, you're not making a lot of progress. You might as well stop. And here we've chosen a value that kind of gets us to reasonable uh, 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 accuracy results um, and a reasonable time. And um, the other is the learning rate, which is basically uh, as you're learning, um, it's how big of a step you make uh, to adjust the weights. So the, the larger the learning rate, the, 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 the bigger the change you make to, 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 the, uh, to the learning rate, to, uh, to, 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 to the bigger the change you make to the weights. <clears throat> um, so the bigger the batch size, um, typically, the bigger the learning rate can be, which means because the more data, the more confident you can be that it's going to give you an accurate estimate of where the real minima is. So you can take a more confident, bigger step toward there. Um, but you will also want to decay that because after a while, um, you know, as you get closer and closer to where the minima is, you want to start taking smaller steps. Um, so you don't kind of step over that minima all the time. So these are some good values. You can experiment with, with changing them later on. And we're going to use that as part of the training. Um, so before we get to the actual training of the model, we have to take our model and compile it. And what compiling does is it takes this model description of layers and converts it into whatever backend representation we have. In this case, uh, TensorFlow. Uh, we also specify uh, how we compute the loss, uh, which is the difference between the real value that we're, we're trying to learn, which is these Y labels, and what the network thinks it is. Um, and so categorical cross entropy is the one that uh, we use when we're uh, learning uh, multiple categories, multiple, yeah, multiple categories. We'll also be specifying the optimizer to use <coughs> Um, there's a bunch of different optimizers that are available that you can experiment with. Um, <clears throat> RMS prop and, and, and Atom are good kind of first go-to optimizers because they, um, 
um, they also have <clears throat> internally, they kind of learn a little bit about the shape of the, <clears throat> um, 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 the, the shape of the um, uh, loss function that we're trying to learn. <clears throat> and so um, they, can, they can help you kind of speed up a little bit. They have like momentum and things that built into them where they can um, um, basically, as you start going toward, uh, if, you, if you're going in the kind of in the same direction toward the minima, they can kind of help to speed you up. And they can also help to get rid of over, um, you know, if you think of the loss function as a landscape where you're trying to get to the bottom, if you're taking very small steps and you get to like a little small little dip, <clears throat> you might not be able to, you might think, well, you're at the minima, you're stuck. But if you imagine rolling a ball down the hill, if the ball starts building up speed, you know, because the hill is fairly steep, if you get kind of a small bowl there, the, the, the ball may clear that and still be able to find a lower ground to go to. So that's what the, the so, so the, these um, optimizers kind of determine how you try to basically descend um, to minimize the loss. So here's one that's been chosen for you. And then the metric is basically uh, <clears throat> kind of what will get logged out as, um, which you're going to basically uh, look for. In this case, we're going to look for, for accuracy, which is, uh, so the loss is for particular samples, how far away they are, how far the real answer is from the network's answer. And accuracy is a sense of overall um, how many did you get correct. Okay. So you can have high loss, um, which is a bad thing, but high accuracy, which is a good thing. But what that kind of means is that you're not really certain about your answers, but your best guess is usually right, even though you're not confident about it. So let's go and, um, and compile that model. And now that we have compiled, we are ready to fit. And so when we fit, we actually do, do the training. <clears throat> so we will see that we pass in the uh, training data, the data set. We pass in the labels because that's what we're trying to learn. We're trying to match the, these Y labels. Um, and we also pass in these hyperparameters like batch size, number of epochs. And we're also passing the validation uh, data as well. Uh, because at the end of every epoch, uh, what we're going to see is that at the end of the epochs, we're going to um, um, evaluate the loss and the accuracy. Um, so this is called the validation on those the test data. So um, we're going to kind of see what that is, is happening there. Okay, <clears throat> and we're also going to shuffle the, the, the data set as well, which is a good thing because that's going to um, basically um, give uh, every, every, through every epoch and every batch uh, will be a little bit different, sampled randomly from the, from the data set. Um, so we see that we're already, you know, almost halfway through. It's taking about, at least for mine, about eight seconds um, per, per, per time step. Um, yours may be different. So uh, depending on which GPU you landed on at, at Google, at the, the Colab. Um, um, so while this is training, I'll explain a little bit to you about a dropout. Let's give me a second. <clears throat> so there's, um, <clears throat> there's something called the, the lucky ticket hypothesis, <clears throat> uh, which says that basically the network, there's, there's a sub-network inside your network that's really important. That's, that's the essential network. And the rest isn't that important. <clears throat> and so if you, um, if you take your final network and you, you basically trim out kind of the unlucky neurons, the ones that don't contribute a whole lot, you end up with a network that still performs very close to the original, but is much, much smaller. So you might think, well, I don't need such a big network to train. You know, I can start with a, with a smaller network. But it turns out, if you take this, this smaller network and try to train it again, 
you don't get good results at all. But if you start from the same values, from the same initial uh, values, which normally are kind of randomized, but if you start from the same random values, you can actually train to the same accuracy on this much smaller network. And the, um, so in a way, um, it seems that some neurons just got lucky with their initial initialization values, and you don't know which ones they were until afterwards. So you really want quite a large um, uh, network um, because you basically want to increase the chance that you have these lucky neurons inside there. Um, the, and so, you know, the bigger the network, the better. But the problem with a big network, of course, is that it can memorize things. Um, and if it, if it starts memorizing your training set, it might start to do actually worse when, it, when you try to generalize on the um, test or validation set or when you try to use it in the real world. So typically what you want to do is you want, you want a network that's big enough to be to, that it could overfit, but you don't want to train it so that it does overfit. And there's two ways to think about drop, these dropout layers. One is, it's kind of like hitting the network over the head and making it kind of underperform in the sense that the neurons, not all the neurons participate in all the information. So in a way, the network can't overfit because not all the neurons are involved every time that can memorize stuff. So basically, um, you can kind of think of it as a faulty memory. So without, with, with a faulty memory, you can't memorize. So you have to kind of learn general rules. Now, interestingly, forgetting is actually probably an important part of uh, generalization for us as well. The other way to think about it is that, uh, so the other way to think about it is that uh, what Dropout is doing is it's basically creating a whole bunch of different um, networks that have seen different data. Um, and so you are basically um, creating, you're basically training a lot of different networks, like um, you know, millions of different smaller networks. And so the lucky one is the one that gets trained. You know, so you can kind of think of it that way. So at this point, my training is done. <clears throat> it took me about three minutes. And you can see where my accuracy is. Uh, so my accuracy, I'm about 67% or 68% um, on the training. But the, um, let me move these windows out of the way so I can see. Um, but only about 62, 63% accuracy on the validation set. So at this point, we kind of want to make sure that um, people are with us. We just try. So, if your training is not done, could you um, could you um, let us know, or let us know if the training is done? You know, so we we can move on. Questions have been answered, and it looks like we're ready to move on. So now we have a trained network. <clears throat> and we kind of have a sense, at least from the numbers, about how it will perform. So about 63% accuracy. Um, let's start to visualize what this output looks like. So we're going to create some helper functions to, um, <clears throat> to plot the history. So basically what you saw here, um, you know, each epoch, we had kind of some values come out. Well, let's plot that and kind of see how training progressed. So what we see, so um, we see, so there's two things on this graph. Um, at the bottom, at the, the, um, the X axis, we have the number of epochs. So, and then on the left-hand side, on the Y, we have the loss. The actual number doesn't have so much meaning as, 
uh, the relationship, you know, whether it goes down or, or you know, comparative. On the right-hand side, we have the accuracy, which is basically when we evaluate that network against the, the testing or the training data set to see how many uh, classification examples it got right. So what we see is um, we see, let's, so let's look at the blue line. The blue line is the training accuracy. And we see it kind of increase um, almost logarithmically, kind of, you know, it's kind of, kind of coming to an asymptote. It's still increasing. Um, we could probably, you know, train for longer and get some more accuracy. But we see that the test accuracy, which is kind of the one that we're really more interested in, because when the network is going to be used in real data, um, <clears throat> that gives us more of a sense of how it will perform. We kind of see that it has plateaued. We also see sometimes that there's dips in it. Not that big, but you know, sometimes it's... Um, accuracy goes down. What we do see for, for the loss, though, is that this network is definitely getting better. It's, it's able to reduce the loss, which is basically the difference between uh, the real value and what it answers for, for the, for the, um, uh, for, for the uh, training data. But we see that the um, the loss in the test case, you know, plateaus and, and even it starts to increase a little bit. Uh, <clears throat> so if we had, if we kept training this network, it might do better. It might start overfitting. It would start doing better on the um, on the training data set, but poor on the um, on the um, a test. So we can also look at we can evaluate <clears throat> on on the whole test set, and we can see basically what we got for the, those final values as numbers. Um, so 0.625. Um, let's kind of get a sense of, you know, what, what the network is predicting. So we're going to, this is a helper function that lets us plot the predictions and the classes that got pr predicted and the uh, probabilities. <clears throat> And the, this activation plot will let us kind of see, so not for this network because um, it can't see inside the, the, the convolutional base network, but we can also um, figure out which parts of the image is contributed the most to the final classification. So there, there's a utility function for that, which, which we will see later. So let's go and just see you know, how it predicted. Okay, so here again, we've got our, you know, 40 random examples. And, um, and in the, um, so we see the image and then the light label is basically how our network classified it. Um, we see that, um, and then the X and the check mark is basically whether it got it wrong or right. So we see, you know, some, some correct examples. We see some wrong examples, like for mine, there's this bird, which looks, which is a frog. I mean, that's the, that's the real image there. Uh, it's kind of blurry and hard to see. So, you know, would you be able to tell it's a, a not a frog? It's, um, <clears throat> so, um, ship got correct. Deer, mm. well, it looks like an emu or a bird of some sort. Uh, but yes, it is big, than, bigger than a normal bird. It has grass as the background. That might be something that the network is keying in on. You know, if there's grass, then it must be like deer or horse sort of thing. They're in a pasture. Um, so here's one here where it said it was a dog. Um, but that one, that one's actually pretty, pretty hard to, to get because, um, you know, it, the ears are pretty big. It's definitely, it's in a house. You know, it's a carpet in the background. Um, so, yeah, you know, okay, well, the, here's one that said cat. That definitely has dog-like qualities, but you can kind of see <clears throat> how it might be confused. And um, <clears throat> this is interesting. Here's one that's um, <clears throat> like, like an eagle, but the eagle's kind of hunched over in a way that you can kind of imagine like a frog sitting. <clears throat> so, 
that gives you maybe kind of a sense of, of what the network is picking up on or, or failing to pick up on. Let's go and look at how confident the network was with its classifications. So <clears throat> here's an example of a frog, um, which it thought was a deer. So I guess you kind of, you know, there, there's the front, back legs, front legs sort of thing. <clears throat> it cut, so, you know, with a small probability, it, so it's, the frog would have been a second choice, but it was pretty confident it was a deer. Here's another one, the difference between automobile and truck. So it got this one correct, but you know, it could definitely have been an automobile, which I guess, good guess. This one was actually a frog. And again, you can kind of see that it didn't quite know what cat, deer, dog, frog, but you know, it, it, um, the probability that, that its estimate was, um, uh, more weighted toward cats, so we, we ended up choosing that. But you can kind of see <clears throat> that there is, you know, some uncertainty that it has with these other categories. Uh, this is this is a good one actually. So here's an automobile, which is, I guess they're saying car, uh, which is it got correct. But you can kind of see it has a very truck-like look to the to its um, code line. And so this network also thought that more confident it was, not, it was a car, but it could have been a truck and so on. You're gonna get a sense of how it's um, um, basically that it kind of gets to, to the loss. So here we're kind of looking at its uncertainty, which is, tells us a bit kind of where that loss was coming from. Okay, so let's get to, um, to um, building our own network. Let's see how we can do if we start from scratch ourselves. So what we're going to do, similar to before, we're gonna create a sequential layer, but this time we're gonna add in our own convolutional uh, layers. And so we start off with sequential, which is the type of model. Uh, and now we're gonna add layers to it. So we add a convolutional layers, uh, we add 32 of them, there are three by three. <clears throat> we have to worry about you know, padding when we get around the, the edges when there's missing data. So, so because we want to preserve the size of the, the feature image and, the, and the, the image the feature image are gonna be the same size, we're gonna use the same as the padding. <clears throat> we're kind of gonna duplicate the, the edges. And then we're gonna pass in that, that image shape similar to the last time. Um, <clears throat> Then we're going to create a ReLU um, uh, activation, another convolution layer, um, and then another ReLU, another activation, and then we're going to do a max pooling on that. And then we're going to drop out after that. And we're going to create kind of one more um, or, or two more convolution layers, looks exactly the same. And finally, we get to the end, and this is our <coughs> classification network just like we saw before. So this is our new from scratch model. And we're going to create it and get a summary out of it. And what we see is <clears throat> we see that, you know, we see the convolutional layers, the max pooling, just like we saw previously. We see our classification at the end. And what we also see is that the total number of params is like 1.2 million and all of them are, are trainable. And um, <clears throat> we're going to start from scratch. We're going to um, stick with the same parameters that we did previously for the hyperparameter. We're going to compile again using the same optimizer and learning rates. And finally, we're going to train using just like before. <clears throat> okay, and it's taking about you know, the same time per, per step for me, maybe. So it's, it's interesting to watch these values. We see that the accuracy is definitely higher than it was last time. We also see that the, uh, it's also higher for the, um, <clears throat> it's also higher for the, um, 
um, validation data set at the, on the test set as well. Okay, so um, hopefully your training should be coming to you know, finishing soon. I will, I will skip to the next steps just to talk about it while you're waiting. Um, and then you can just kind of run, run them afterwards. Um, we're going to basically do this much the same that we did with that previous uh, trained uh, network. We're going to plot its history. <clears throat> and so here's some interesting, interesting things. Uh, we see the loss as, as before on the training set, um, you know, basically follow a very similar smooth path. Um, we also, for the accuracy, you know, we, we see it a similar sort of, of curve. It's starting to plateau, not quite yet, uh, but of course it's, it, the, it's higher than it was in the previous one. The interesting thing here is that the <clears throat> accuracy on the um, uh, validation, the, te the test set, is, is closer to, the, um, to following the accuracy for the test set. But we also see variability in both of those. The, the test loss uh, also seems to be decreasing as well, although <clears throat> they happen to go up a little bit at, at the end. And if we look at, we, we evaluate on our entire test set, um, we see that it's actually quite good. Test accuracy, almost 76% accurate. So that's a significant jump. <clears throat> so why did this happen? I mean, we took a, a network that, yes, it was trained with a different domain, but um, um, you know, it had, it had seen a lot more data. It was much, much bigger. Um, you know, why didn't we do it as well? Um, well, we're we'll going to we'll go on and explore that. Um, but in part, you know, we have a very small data set, so it didn't really need a, a large um, model to begin with. And also much of the things which the other network has learned about images and edges and so on um, aren't as relevant for this network, for, for this data set. And they also um, originally were for much larger resolution images as well. So <clears throat> let's look at how, but we'll see a little bit more of that as we visualize more of what's happening inside this network. Let's just see what the results look like. Well, <clears throat> we see that, um, um, you know, it still gets a few wrong, but we can kind of see like, there's a horse, but it, it says a deer. You, can, you know, it's, it's pretty close. Um, th there's a moose, but um, it says cat. And I guess you can kind of almost see that. Um, oh, and there's a cat. It says this is a cat. Oh, interesting. And it's a bird. There's a little, little beak there. Tricky. Let's see how it... Um, how certain it is. So remember, its, um, its loss, its, its test loss, was decreasing much, much better than it was in that previous network. And when we look at it, we can see basically that the, the confidence that it has, typically for the one that it picks, it's really quite confident. The other secondary choices, they're, 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 uh, the estimate of their likelihood is, is much um, typically much smaller. Here, here's you know, maybe a counterexample where it's an airplane, but it thought it was a bird, you know, but, or it could have been a deer or a frog. So that one. But you, know, you see an example here. It's quite confident that it, this was an airplane. <clears throat> Let's go and just visualize what this network is, is made of. <clears throat> we, if we look at the convolutions, Again, we see similar sorts of, of patterns of you know, edge detectors, maybe at, at different angles. They look kind of similar. <clears throat> Let's look at, at, at what it looks like when, when this is applied to a particular image, in this case uh, of this dog. And um, 
<clears throat> so we can see, so, so here's this, this one, doesn't seem to really care for light colors, but likes dark colors, it seems. Um, you can see things which maybe correlate with edges, like this one here. And in a, in a similar way, we kind of see similar things going on as we go up, up, the, up the network at higher levels. Let's go and look at what sort of features these uh, convolution kernels like. <clears throat> so the interesting thing is that early on, this looks kind of different from the, the um, um, the previous network. We started almost immediately with kind of, you know, edges, uh, edge patterns. <clears throat> Here we don't get to these kind of edge patterns until the second set of layers. And then we, and then our network doesn't have the kind of texture patterns that the, um, the previous network has. And this is one that we didn't see previously for the other network, but it lets us look at the activations. So what we can do is we can ask our network. So in this one, you know, it thought it was a bird. Um, it also maybe thought it could have been a cat or a dog or a frog. And we're gonna ask it, what parts of the original image play basically um, gave you the most evidence to make you confident in this. So there's this part of the image down here, which made us very confident that it was a bird. Um, there's this part here, which made us maybe think it was a cat um, or a dog. Maybe it thought that was a nose or something like that. Or these things could have been a frog, but overall, you know, you see part of the beak there, part of the head maybe is what gave us confidence that it was a bird. So, so this one, this one I got wrong. <laughs> I thought it was a ship. It's an airplane. These are the parts of the image that kind of contributed uh, to that. Um, <clears throat> similar bird. Um, so here we see it's pretty confident it's a bird, and the tail seems to be what kind of made the network most confident that it was a bird, more so even than the head. And here we get a ship, and it looks like you know the top of the ship, the the captain's. Or the, or the, the uh, control uh, deck is, seems to be what it seemed to highlight, and um, and so on, and that gives us insight into <clears throat> what the network is looking for inside our, our images. Okay, <clears throat> so we have now created actually two networks. One we reused an existing network and transferred that knowledge over, and just created a classifier on top of that got so-so results. We then made our own network from scratch using convolution layers and then our uh, classification layer on top. <clears throat> it did pretty good actually, 76% 70, 70, accuracy on, on, on the, uh, on, on the um, uh, test set. And we get a sense of what sort of features it was looking for, um, you know, certainly simpler than the previous network and what parts of the images uh, it was looking at that helped it come to those, make those decisions. So let's think about <clears throat> something else that we could do. We now have two uh, models. Um, they each have, you know, different knowledge. The, certainly the, um, <clears throat> um, you know, yes, the, the, the model that we trained from scratch did better on the smaller data set, um, but this other data set was trained on um, you know, more data and, and knows a little bit more about the image features than, than our, our model does. What happens if we try to combine them together? <clears throat> so that's what we're going to do. We're going to, um, we're going to go and um, basically take these two models and combine them. Now, <clears throat> when we do that, we no longer have a sequential model, one after the other, we kind of have like a graph that we take the input, the input goes in two directions into each of these networks. And then that gets the, and then the output from those networks gets fed back into another layer. And, uh, and that is where we do the classification there. So 
what we're going to do is we're going to, there's a function here. We pass in two trained models. And, um, and if we don't pass them in, um, we're going to kind of create our own, but we're going to pass them in. And we're also going to set them to be not trainable anymore because we don't, they already were trained. So we don't want to repeat that. Um, and then what we're going to do is we're going to, so we're going to use a, uh, the functional API. And the way that we use the functional API in Keras is we don't start with sequential. We start with a layer and then we basically use that as a function that we pass in the inputs to. So here we create an input layer. Um, and um, similar to before, and but it's called inputs. And these inputs are going to be passed into our two networks. And we'll see this in the, in the graph shortly. <clears throat> and then we're going to concatenate, the, the layer that comes afterwards is going to concatenate their two outputs. And then we're going to put a kind of a classification, standard classification layer after that. Um, and then, we're, so this is basically where we kind of bring it all together. We create a model. This is the functional model. We pass as inputs, this input layer as outputs or output layer, which is, um, and then um, just give it a name and return the model. So we're going to run that. <clears throat> which just defines the function. And now we're going to create it. And what we see here is, um, so we basically see we have an input and then we have two sequential networks that both take their input. We concatenate them together um, and then uh, ha have our classification there after that. And we can see that we have like, over 16 million parameters, of which we only have to train um, um, 15,000. So let's go and just plot, let's go and look at what this model looks like. <clears throat> so there's the input layer, it feeds into these two other sequential networks that we had. We can concatenate the results and feed them into the classification as before. We're going to compile that layer, or this model, just as before, using the same uh, uh, hyperparameters. And we're going to run. Oh, but not quite the same. We've only had to train for five epochs, not 25, because we have two pre-trained networks. And, the, um, and we're just basically just trying to, so basically we're, the, the networks are kind of giving us, this is what we think. And then we're going to basically take that and figure out you know, who tells us the best answer in what case. Okay, so now this is interesting. This is the best network we've trained so far. Let's go and look what its, it's um, history plot is like. Well, <clears throat> so first of all, almost immediately, <laughs> it's ready to train. So you might ask, you know, why, why don't we see these kind of the, the regular kind of um, asymptotic curves we see before? These values are basically, they, they're done like after the epoch. So basically after the first epoch, our little classifier is almost completely trained. It only improves, improves a little bit. <clears throat> we see that the, um, that the training loss, you know, goes quite low. The, um, the test loss is still higher um, but, uh, but the accuracy, both for the test, the training and the test, very, very high. It's, it's, it's actually the, the best network we've, we've trained so far, which is actually maybe a little counterintuitive that we, that by combining two kind of weaker networks, we ended up with one that was a bit, that was stronger. <clears throat> and that's, you know, 76% versus 79 so that's that's like a you know um, three percent improvement or so in um, in accuracy. Just... Oops. And we'll just do one of those prediction plots. 
So our network is more accurate. Let's look at the mistakes. So there's this plane that it thinks is a bird. Well, you can kind of see that. A dog. It said it was a dog, but that's a cat. But that is kind of rather dog-like. And there's a deer. Well, there's someone riding the deer. That's, that, that's a horse. So yeah, that gives you kind of a sense of, of what it thought. But um, the, the, um, the accuracy level is, is quite good for this. Um, so um, where we're gonna, so, so um, So what I'm going to do is I'm going to skip this. <clears throat> um, so um, what this one is basically going to do is, is basically what we did previously, but training everything from scratch. Uh, and in that case, uh, the, um, uh, we don't really do any better. Um, and it just takes, takes more steps. So let's go skip that and skip to skip connections. Okay, <clears throat> so um, interesting thing is, is that we have seen, <clears throat> when we've looked inside these networks, we definitely saw that the original ImageNet trained VGG convolutional neural network, <clears throat> which was substantially bigger and deeper than the network that we trained, it definitely knew things about the image processing domain that our network never learned because it was, it was a bigger network and it has seen more data. But we weren't able to utilize that kind of extra knowledge that it had. In part, because it was sequential, um, if the information from these earlier layers was not propagated, um, it was basically lost. <clears throat> so the classifier at the top of that network, or at the end of it, <clears throat> only had the very last convolutional layer to consult. And if that convolutional layer hadn't brought through all the previous information, then there was th th that information there wasn't available to make a decision. Um, so what we can do is <clears throat> we can, um, you know, we will feed the, uh, the, the features, uh, the feature images through the different convolutional layers, just as we did before. But what we can also do is, is we can take this, the output from one of those convolutional layers and also pass it ahead. So in a similar way that when we were working with this, the previous functional model where we split the inputs to go into two separate networks and then brought them back together. Well, we can take the output from one of these convolutional layers and split its output into two, one that feeds into the next feature detectors and one that goes right to the very end, which can, you know, so basically that information remains available in uh, to later layers. And in this way, the network doesn't have to learn to retain that information, right? Um, um, it just has to worry about the features that are, that is, it's able to figure out from the previous features, um, but we don't lose previous information. And that's what skip connections are about. <clears throat> so there's some examples that you can um, explore, um, some papers and some um, a blog post, if you want to explore this in more detail, uh, we're going to go and create our own. <clears throat> so we're going to basically use the same sorts of um, layers and models and, and, um, and, um, and uh, capabilities of Terrace, of Keras to do that. Um, here is our function for creating the skip connected classifier. Now, it's, um, um, it's a little bit complicated, so I will skip over some of the details, except just to describe what's basically happening. We had this previous model that had these sequential layers. It was quite deep. That, that was this VGG16 network. And what I have to do is I have to pull them apart and kind of reattach them. And that's what this code is doing. 
And I also, after, when I do reattach them, I kind of need like a little mini classifier there as well to kind of turn the large image space into kind of a smaller. Um, so basically, after each convolutional layer, I, I want a, li a little classifier that is um, kind of going to tell me, is, what it's going to learn is what important features at this con convolutional layer are important to classify? What should, I, what should I remember? And in doing this, it's able to pass these things forward to the final classifier. So we have basically a way to turn this convolutional layer into a smaller dense layer that's kind of a mini classifier itself, but it's basically it's helping to preserve the information. And then we basically go through the sequential layers and, um, and put them together um, and, and, and then uh, connect them together. And by the time we're done, um, we're gonna end up with, with, the, with a model that probably is best understood if we see the, the graph from it. So here we're gonna create it and we're gonna quit the um, summary and the plot in one go. So the, um, <clears throat> as you can see, we start out with the input layer. We get our first sequential, which is basically a convolutional layer. It gets passed to the next convolutional layer, but it also gets passed to a flatten and, and, a, and, a, and a mini classifier. And that gets passed all the way to the final classifier at the end. And the same for every other classifier, every other um, convolutional layer. <clears throat> you know, we split it up, flatten, and do a little bit of um, classification on it, or just keep the important information, and then pass its information along. So, <clears throat> what I'm going to do, we're going to train this model for 25 time steps. So, I'm going to run that. <clears throat> How are we doing? So training is still going. So it's taking longer to train. We can look back at the, um, <clears throat> so we can look back here. So this network had uh, 30 or th you know, almost 31 million total parameters. So of course it's a bigger model and each time step takes longer to train. It's taking about twice as long. Um, <clears throat> And we still have, um, you know, the, the, the 14, 15 million uh, non-trainable parameters, um, <clears throat> but about uh, 16 million trainable. And um, so taking a little, little longer, but how are we doing? Uh, let's not spoil the surprise. So maybe this is what, while we're waiting, we're just gonna ask, you know, how are people doing? Are they, um, you know, have questions? Uh, has their training begun? How are things going? Okay, cool. Okay, and we're done. <clears throat> so, so <clears throat> these, these, this looks quite nice. So, you know, we haven't overlearned, uh, we're not overfitting that much or not, hardly at all. <clears throat> the, um, the training and the test loss is kind of near each other. It's not as, as variable. Um, <clears throat> and the, the um, we, we got a significant improvement over which was our first pre-trained model. The, this is the, one, the very first one we started out with. This is a significant, you know, almost 10% improvement. So let's see, what, what did our, um, our simple CNN do? So our, our simple CNN still did, did better. <clears throat> so the, um, so that the best version that we've got so far was the one where we combined, <clears throat> um, of uh, both of our models to, together um, and added just a very simple, uh, so we, we had trained both and then by um, just creating a simple classifier to basically figure out, um, you're getting 
getting the answer from both of the networks and then figuring out who to believe and by how much got us an extra 3%. And we see by, by preserving some of the lower level information that was in that original um, pre-trained uh, model um, and preserving it all the way to the end of the network, um, our classifier was able to improve significantly over the um, our previous example. And so let's go. Cool. And now, now we can kind of see <clears throat> which ones that, and and it's, it's doing pretty good. So the ones that are, um, yeah, you can, So, so you can kind of see how they might think these things, but um, cool. <clears throat> so um, the next example, this, the final example here is for a multi-GPU case, which we don't have at present. So that is the um, introduction to um, a deep learning and image um, classification with Keras. Um, so we've seen a number of things. We have seen how to process and explore our data sets. <clears throat> we've seen how to reuse existing models that have been pre-trained. Uh, we've learned how to build some of our own models too, some, some simple ones and some more complex ones. And <clears throat> uh, different model architectures that have had interesting and different uh, performance characteristics. So <clears throat> um, I hope that you have got um, something of val value out of this, um, and it will, you know, help and inspire your future explorations into image processing and, and, and deep learning. Um, I would invite you to the um, session, the, so the exercise session tomorrow, uh, which uh, Mosin can talk about, and um, I think that starts at, at 8, 8 30. <clears throat> so, there is a, an exercise notebook that we that we can work through, and we'll be there to answer questions. But basically, uh, we'll, you'll be working with a different data set, um, the MNIST uh, digit classification data set, and you'll be able to build your own classifier using what you've learned here. And you will then tr train it um, and see how well it performs. Now, now MNIST is a simpler data set, <clears throat> And um, although it has the same number of categories, um, it's you know it's a little bit smaller, and um, and black and white or grayscale. <clears throat> and then um, after after you've tr you've basically so you've got a chance to kind of try what you've learned here hands on and get feedback and help from from us again, and um, and then we will learn how to basically uh, participate in a Kaggle competition. Um, to submit our tr trained MNIST digit classifier to one of their competitions. And that will help prepare you for the AI um, um, a, a challenge that will be held in, in the afternoon. Um, so, so that will be the, um, the, um, the, the, the competition um, that you'll be able to um, see a different data set again. Um, it's a, a, a data set for, 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 for housing prices. So, um, the, um, so the, 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 the housing price data set, of course, is a little different than image, um, uh, uh, image data set, but still numbers. Um, you could use Keras, you could use some of the other function capabilities, um, you know, scikit, uh, it's a possibility. Um, uh, 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 David Koo, who's our data scientist, um, uh, would be a good person to to ask questions of then as you, as you explore that. <clears throat> Some of the techniques that we have seen, like for PCA and and, and TISNI, would will possibly help understand those data sets uh, as well. Um, so they're not quite as as, as highly dimensional as these ones are. <clears throat> so uh, they may end up um, kind of uh, clustering out uh, more easily. But the, um, the sort of uh, techniques, the, the, the kind of uh, 
classification techniques that you've learned here can help you with the um, um, uh, the project tomorrow with, without giving it all away. So there's still stuff to explore and to learn. So uh, with that, I will turn it over back to Mosin and Saber. And um, I thank you very much for attending and hope you got a lot out of it. Thanks, Glenn, and uh, wonderful training. Thanks a lot. Um, hopefully everyone enjoyed uh, and everyone is geared up and ready for the exercises. Uh, actually, it starts at 9 a.m. in the morning uh, as scheduled. The link is going to be the same. Uh, please rejoin this link. I'm going to start uh, broadcasting the link at Nineshop. So yeah, um, let's see you tomorrow morning. Uh, Sabir, you want to close? Um, yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Glendon. I, I could myself even follow and be a student of this course. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, and uh, I hope everyone took advantage of it. And for those who will be watching this on YouTube, uh, I'm certainly uh, sure that they will have uh, a lot of fun doing it as well. Uh, and with that, thanks a lot, Glendon, and uh, we'll join tomorrow again.